Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us for Performance Analytics and Reporting Office Hours. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So as a reminder, as we, as we get started, this session is absolutely for you. We're here to answer your questions, give you some fresh perspectives. Um, please uh, interject with your questions in the Q&A section if you have them. Um, right now, everybody is, is on mute, uh, but if we do have a question, we may unmute you if that's okay with you to get some follow-up detail. But please remember, this session is for you and we wanna help you. That is our main goal here. All of this session is being recorded. It'll be posted to YouTube and in the community uh, either later today or tomorrow, as well as all of our other sessions are posted there as well. So if you go back to the community where you registered for this session, you'll find a list of our previous topics and links to those recordings in those decks, and you'll see some of the upcoming topics as well. There's a playlist on YouTube as well. If you want to subscribe, that will remind you every time there's a new one. And this is for you. We want to answer the questions that you, that you have, the cases you have, the use cases, the problems you're seeing. There is an article that you'll see linked in the community as well about the uh, office hours topics we should cover. I know last time we covered one that was specifically asked for, and we want to hear what you would like us to talk about, and we'll cover those in future sessions. And I'm not going to stop talking about it, but the K20 labs are available for you and now learning. Great, great content there. I believe we have a, a dozen or so performance analytics and reporting labs there for you to take. They are hands-on. You get the instance. You get to work through it. So don't miss that opportunity. Uh, if you have some time on your hands, head out to Now Learning and take advantage of those K20 labs. And as we're, as we're going, we're ready to start our, our main session today. Today we have Thomas Davis, one of our outbound product managers, talking about the CMDB query builder um, and how we use that in reporting. I, I know this might be a new topic for, for many of us. Um, really important stuff. So I appreciate you guys, you guys coming and listening. And I am looking forward to what Thomas has to say. Are you there, Thomas? I'm here. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate it. Uh, so let me share my screen here. There we go. Everyone should be seeing the same thing as before. Looks great. Let me drag this out of the way here. All right, great. So again, uh, like Adam said, my name is Thomas Davis, and uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about the CMDB Query Builder and how we can leverage it in reporting. So the first thing that we kind of want to talk about here is just kind of give some um, information in general, you know, what is CSDM and, um, you know, the CMDB framework and, and things of that nature, just so you have some understanding of that. So when we talk about common services, what we're really focusing on is standards and the definitions it takes to have an effective CSDM, which is the CMDB framework um, of our data model. So the combination of having standards and the definition together inside the CMDB framework provides to us the common service data model um, as you're seeing here on the screen. And you know that framework is definitely important and you'll see that as we go forward here, uh, building out our queries uh, a little bit later on. So what is a service and a service offering? So when we get into the, the CMDB Query Builder, you'll, you'll see that there are services that are out there. And um, there are a few different types of services that are there. Um, we have, and first we have the application service, and this is an instance or unique deployment of a business application. This is specific to its environment, whether it be dev, test, QA, prod, et cetera. These are truly unique deployments of your applications. Uh, next, we have technical service. We reference this as being the provider of technology that the business will consume or sell, depending on your particular business model. Uh, and then we have business service. This is the consumer of the technology. So another portion of it is what's called a service offering. And so we have services, but also another level, the service offers, these become extremely important to the CI. This is where SLAs are stored for the service, where we keep our data on who owns or manages the service. This is where we have the support group that helps with auto routing on incidents, the assignment group for change, so it can be auto populated with changes. Other elements like identifying its criticality, identifying any other commitments that, along with the, that go along with the particular offering itself. So again, these come into play uh, as we go further along. So what is the CMDB Query Builder? So the CMDB Query Builder allows you to easily build complex infrastructure and service queries. Uh, you can span multiple CMDB classes and you can also see tables that aren't CMDB tables, they're called non-CMDB tables. 
that involve many CIs that are connected uh, with different relationships. So the Query Builder provides a canvas, which you drag the CI classes that you want included in the query, which we'll see here in a little bit. Uh, and then you add relationships that you can use and or operators between the classes, CI classes, and then define relationship properties uh, for the query. And then you can see some of the roles that are required here um, as well in order to do this. So inside the uh, Query Builder, there's two different types of uh, queries that you could actually do. So the first, which is what we're going to go over uh, today, the CMDB query, again, is a query that, you know, queries infrastructure for CI classes and non-CMDB tables. Uh, when you create the query, you can add tables from a list of non-CMDB tables. The list of non-CMDB tables include uh, subsets of tables with the systems such as asset, task, problem, things of that nature, which have references to configuration items. Um, this is something that's probably not new to you, but here you can expose those a lot easier. Um, and then there, of course, there's a system property where you can actually limit uh, the non-CMDB tables that you want uh, people to choose from if you cho so desire to do that. Uh, and then the other one is a service mapping query. So this query is framed with application service map. You define the pattern and query for application uh, that have patterns in their definition. The relationships in service map mapping queries are matched by single level direct relationships which is similar to CMDB queries. In addition, they are also matched by multi-level indirect relationships. Uh, a query for a relationship between two CI classes is satisfied with two CI classes and connected by intermediate classes that are not specified in the query. So this gives you a little bit more functionality um, for the service side, service mapping uh, query as opposed to the CMDB query itself. So uh, before we get started, we just kind of want to throw out a use case that'll help us as we go forward when we start creating uh, the things that we're going to do. So a uh, vener very generic use case, but it will, uh, again, help us uh, see what we're looking for. So uh, we have issues related to Hoovers, uh, but they aren't always obvious. So we want to check the incidents against service that depend on Hoovers, regardless of what they are. And, and Hoovers is just a sales perspective. Prospect information source is all that is. Uh, some may be familiar with it, some may not. Okay, so the CMDB Query Builder is as simple as going to the filter navigator, typing in CMDB Query Builder, and selecting it. And this will open it up, and it actually, what it does, it'll, it'll open up into a new tab. Um, and this is kind of what the, the, or this is what the tab will look like when you, when you opens up, when it opens up in a new tab. So basically what we'll do here is we'll, we'll create, we'll start with the creation of the process of our query. So, you know, after you click, you click create new, you name it. Uh, in our case, we're going to name it Hoover Incidents. And then we make sure that we have CMDB query selected. And then we just simply click create. So this is our canvas. So what I wanted to do first was kind of talk about the canvas and the properties and things of that nature that you actually get with the canvas before we start building. So it'll kind of help you out uh, along the way and you'll know what you have. So first, let's look at our filter on the left side of the screen. So this is our filter. Um, looks very familiar, familiar to any other uh, search capabilities inside of the platform. Uh, and here, basically what we can do is we can look for uh, what we want to search for. We can search for CIs, we can search for services uh, associated with them. Uh, this is a hierarchy list and you know you find what you want and then you drag it out onto the canvas. And then, <clears throat> again, there we go. And then the next is the non-CMDB tables. So these are tables that are not in the CMDB directly. Um, can, it cannot be the first starting node of your query, and you cannot connect the CMDB class to two non-CMDB tables at the same time. Again, we would find what we need and drag it to the canvas. And next we have save query. So you would use this if you had any queries that, um, any service mapping queries that you had already had. You could actually see those, drag those out onto the canvas as well. And then you could create combinations of using service mapping query and the CMDB query itself. And then on the other side of the screen, we have our properties and filters. So in the property section, this is where you'll establish relationships between your nodes that you'll see here uh, in a moment and determine what level the relationships are and if you need to add related items between the nodes or whatnot. The UI notations will tell you when you have a relationship, which is uh, a full line you'll see here in a moment. Uh, if information is missing, such as a relationship type or whatnot, then it would be, uh, you would see a red asterisk in the center of that line. Uh, and again, you'll see that here in a moment. You would also see levels of the relationship and the number of relationship types included for the connection. 
Um, and then the filters in the apply filter section, this gives you the ability to add filters directly to the nodes themselves. Um, and you'll actually see those filters. So you, and again, you can use uh, the and or operators in your filters. You can add filters at the node level directly, which we'll do uh, here in a little bit. So again, um, this will actually show you what those filters are as you build those out based on which node that you have selected. So what's a starting node? So a start node is basically the start point for your query and it, it's noted by uh, a gray background. The first class that you drag to the canvas becomes your start node of the query and you cannot select a different start node. Once you have that particular one, that is your start node. Now you could obviously delete uh, anything that you have dragged out onto your canvas and start over and that would give you a new start node. But in, in general, the very first one that you drag out there is your start node. So in complex queries, the start node must always be the only node connected to an and or operator. Uh, if you try to connect a second node to an and or operator that the start node is connected to, the query will fail and prompt you to select a different start node. So, uh, and, you, and again, you'll see that here in a moment. <clears throat> So our relationship properties. So when you connect classes on the canvas, the query builder will display the connection properties to the right side bar. When you can configure the part, you can configure the properties of relationships such as relationships direction. So we talked about this a little bit ago. Um, and for service mapping queries, you can configure whether the query for related or unrelated CIs. So this image here kind of shows you a little bit of what it's gonna look like. So now let's get into actually creating something. So what we wanna do is we wanna search for business service uh, and we wanna drag that over to the screen. And you can see here that we're simply just dragging it over. Notice that the color is gray. This is our indica indication that it is the first node in our query. Everything will build from it. When you click on the node, you can see the properties and the applied filters if there were. Uh, if something was applied, you'd already see that there. Click on the node again and you'll see and notice the ability to add property columns uh, to appear in the query result. result. So as we add these out on the canvas, every one that we drag out, you can actually add columns from those particular, uh, that particular data. So you actually see that in the result once you run it. Uh, so again, this is our first node. And again, your indicator is that it is gray and you'll notice going forward that the other ones that we drag out um, will not. So next we wanna grab a non-CMDB uh, table. So we're gonna search for incidents and we're gonna drag that out. And now we'll need to establish a relationship between business service and incident. So again, if you notice, once we click the first square and the second square, you'll see the green line. And of course, there's the red asterisk that we talked about earlier. So that red asterisk is there is because we have not determined what that relationship is gonna be. So for here, we're gonna say, the reference column for this is the business service. So that has established that relationship between the two and it understands that the incident is gonna connect itself to the business service based on the business service itself. So again, this is as simple as it, as it is, just dragging things out. So from here, we can actually see some results. So if we click save and then we click run, it'll actually open up a new tab and it'll show the results that we actually have. So here we've actually been able to connect two business services with the incident. And here it defaults to 100. So make sure that you, you click on load all results. This will become important later on when we create uh, schedules and whatnot with it. So you wanna make sure that all of that data is actually seen. So because we're not seeing a whole lot of data here, and obviously we wanna look for Hoover specific incidents, things that are related to Hoover, we need to add a little bit more to this query to, to see that. So next we're gonna go back over and we're gonna click on CMD classes again, and then we're gonna look for the CI that is Hoover. So, or actually we're gonna grab configuration item out, and then we're gonna actually add a filter to our CI that's gonna look for Hoover. So again, we join it up to the business service, uh, and here you just click on the box. Again, you can see that it's a green line with an asterisk. And basically what we're gonna tell it is that we don't really care what the relationship is. We want any relationship type that is out there. So we select that and now we have uh, those relationships built and you can see, you know, it's recycling now, but you can see that it actually tells you what level it can tell. It tells you the and or operators, all of that directly onto the canvas. And, um, and again, we're looking for any relationship that is out there uh, so we can see any of those Hoover uh, particular incidents. 
So here we can click save and run. Um, and we can see that when we run that and it, and it opens up in a new tab here again, there we go, uh, that we have quite a bit of results, over 12,000 different results. So let's, let's dwindle that down a little bit. Let's filter that down a little bit. So we want to add a filter to the CI that's going to look for uh, Hoover. And then let's also look at incidents where they were created on this year. So all we simply do is we go back to our canvas and you, you notice that when you click on any one of the nodes, there is a filter button there uh, that is very familiar, same as in a platform. And here we're going to look for name that starts with Hoover. So this is going to bring back all the CIs that start with Hoover, but then to go a little bit further, let's look at incidents that were created on this year. Um, and these filters are applied directly to the query, and then we'll click save and run um, again once this is done, and we'll actually be able to see that we have dwindled that down to quite a bit less. Now we have 388 different results. That was fast, but it was 388. So now that we've dwindled everything down and we think that we have our query the way that we need it, let's build a report off of it. Let's see what we can do there. So you can create reports uh, from the query builder. Uh, there are some steps that you have to do prior to it being ready to use. So let's walk through those. Uh, and here are the roles, the roles that are required um, to be able to do reporting inside of the CMDB Query Builder. So a couple things. So after you create and save your query, you can create a dynamic report from that query that you, have, that you will update and show the latest query results. A couple of things that have to be set prior to building a report. The query report button is only activated after the query has been saved. The query has a schedule and the entire set of query results is present after a query run. And this is what I was talking about earlier where you click on the button, once you see your results, it says load all results. So the initial report is created, it's based off the results of the initial run and of the saved query. Every time that it is updated with the, with the related, latest results, it shows that there. So a big thing to understand is that if you change the definition, the query definition itself, you will have to create a new report because the query and the existing report are no longer in sync. These Prior to you actually changing it, the, scheduled, the schedule that we create will always run that same particular um, report. So again, if you change that query anywhere, just remember that you have to save and run that report um, again. You don't have to recreate the schedule. The same schedule will work, but you have to make sure that you save that report and, um, or create a new report, and you can use the existing schedule to, uh, to run the, the information for that. And basically, when you create these, they in themselves become report sources, data sources. So we can use reports, this report source in another report. We can use the data source in uh, PA. We can use it, you know, in those things, uh, like any, any other way that you do anything else. So, so how do we create a report uh, from the CMDB uh, builder? So when we create a report, like I said, it's essentially just creating a schedule report. So if you've created schedule reports before, this screen will look very familiar to you. So it's passing over the name, it's passing over the particular query, and then you can decide when you wanna run it. For our case here, we're running it on demand, but you can schedule it to run as often as you, as you would like. Um, and then you, then you click submit and you have it scheduled. It's that simple. So let's create, now that we have it scheduled, now that we've ran it, we've decided on what our query is, we've made sure that all results are loaded uh, when we view it, and we've created a schedule, now the Create Report button is actually visible. So now you can click on that, and when you click on that, again, very familiar screen here, it takes you directly to the report designer, it passes over all of the information, so the report name is set to the name of the saved query, the source type is a data source, the data source is the table in which the query's results are stored, and then the query sys ID is the ID of the latest run of the query, which is important based on what you've created. So again, if you were to create something new or change, then that sys ID would obviously change. So you can see all of that information directly in the report designer. So let's say that once you, when you build that, that it's just not enough data. And obviously that is not with only three columns. 
So you have the same ability um, as any other report that you have, uh, which is very familiar to DotWalk, and we've added those together. Now you can actually get to any of those and you can add that data directly over. And, uh, and when you save the report, the report itself is saved with those particular columns. Um, and in our case, we needed more, so we have more value and actually see what we're doing. So again, in the report designer is no different than any other time that you've done it. Grab those, th those columns that you want, move those over, and then when you hit okay, I added quite a few here. Um, and then when you hit okay, it'll actually bring all of those particular columns back just like any other report that you have. And here we go, I think that's the last one. <clears throat> I'm removing those top ones at the top. Those are the ones that are with just the creation of the report itself. So we run it and, and it recycled very fast, but it had the results that we were looking for. So now that we have a data source slash report source, we can essentially use that inside a PA like you've used any other report source or data source if you've done that before. Um, so again, the great thing about this is that if you create these queries and they're very specific, it gives you the governance that you need now that you've saved it as a uh, report and it's generated that report source, the governance around that helps you, you know, going forward to make sure that people are reporting on it exactly the way that it needs to be reported on. So here you can see a screenshot of where I've taken that same report source and I've put it inside of an indicator source and it automatically knows the facts table and um, you can see that the sys ID, there's JavaScript there and it, the sys ID is a part of that. So it knows exactly where to look for that going forward. And then you can actually use the same exact thing in a breakdown. So if you were to use an existing breakdown and you needed to map, you can map directly to that same table and then use those uh, things that are in your tables directly in a, a breakdown. Uh, so if you had a, an existing one, you could use that or you could create a new one and the mapping and all of those things work exactly the way. So you can see here that I've used that query and I've mapped to the column that I want to work and uh, now this breakdown mapping will actually work. So here you can see further that it's, we've connected it to the particular indicator that uh, we have and that incident state is there on that particular indicator. And here you can see a scorecard where we've taken that same exact query that we've used inside of Query Builder, uh, although very generic in its, in its uh, self, but we have been able to break it down by those particular uh, states. And now we can see that for this year that there have been quite a bit of incidents that were related to Hoover um, there are those other ones that are closed and these are the ones that are still um, in progress. So again, uh, as you go further and further along, uh, you can use these things directly in reporting or PA uh, and really build as much as you possibly can based on the relationships that you need and the relationships that are there that you can establish inside of those queries. So what are some takeaways? So, CNDB Query Builder, excuse me, gives the ability to create dynamic reports, uh, queries and reports and performance analytics. So the big one that uh, I think would probably be the highlight is in some cases you can actually use this in place of a database view, so that, that database view that you have to create. So what does that do? That saves the, a lot of time, right? Because you have to actually go to admins to create database views. So here you could potentially create some of the same things that were needed in database views existently, and you could create those directly in the query builder. So it gives a lot more power to you um, at your fingertips to create some things. So, uh, and, and again, so since we're able to get report sources from it, it again gives you the ability to have some governance around the data that's actually being reported on. So the same way that you would create a report inside a report designer, and have all of the different filters that you have and then save that and then save it as a report source and let your uh, people use those. Essentially, Query Builder is the same exact thing. You build it all out in the Query Builder, set your filters to what you want them to be, establish those relationships that you want them to be, you save that, it is established report source, and then boom, you have, you're able to apply the same um, governance. Now understand that again, if you go back in at any point and change that query, then a new report would have to be generated um, for that. So I know that I've given you a lot, um, hopefully not too fast, but there are some great um, 
references and recommendations uh, that you should do to really bring you up to speed even more on this. There's a couple great labs that are out there from K20, uh, drive real value and common service data model uh, that talks about the CMDB as well. And then learning uh, or make better decisions with Query Builder itself, which again really talks about and shows some uh, building of queries. And um, you know, there's probably a lot of use cases that are out there. Hopefully, uh, all everybody that's on the call, their head is sort of spinning and thinking of different use cases where they can actually use this. So uh, I would definitely encourage you to go and get some training. Um, these were videos that I pre-recorded here that you're seeing. So um, you will want to kind of go a little bit slower so you can understand and things like that. But definitely start with those two labs. And then, of course, there's always ServiceNow documentation that is out there. And here's a couple um, good ones that, you know, basically – uh, building queries with the CMDB query, bu query builder and then also creating reports um, in the query builder as well. So go to those, look at those if you need help and, um, you know, again, try to sort of push the envelope a little bit and think of different use cases where you can actually do this. Um, a lot of times the visual aspect of creating those queries and dragging those, in those out onto the canvas uh, is a lot easier as opposed to you know, knowing uh, the names of particular uh, tables or whatnot or CIs that are out there. So having that search filter right at the Canvas level will, will help you create a lot of those. Um, and with that, are there any questions? Oh, the questions are coming in. All right. So let, let me uh, ask you a couple of these as, as we come in. Okay. Um, uh, the first question can the query builder be used in other areas of service now uh, other than CMDB? So right now, uh, it, it only supports, uh, you know, CMDB. However, there are some updates to it that are coming in Paris that may give the ability uh, to do that. But I know that um, currently right now, it is uh, just CMDB. Uh, however, the non-CMDB tables kind of can give you the ability to look for some of the other things that perhaps that you're looking for that are inside of the platform. So understand that you can look for some things there. The biggest thing is whether or not you can establish a relationship between whatever's in that non CMDB table and something that is in uh, the CMDB classes themselves. But, but at this point there needs to be an anchor and it's got to touch CMDB. Exactly. It's got to touch. It's got to be able to establish a relationship. Great. Mobile. All right, so you, you were the one who talked to us about mobile a, a couple sessions ago. Um, can I display these reports? Uh, well, this, the question is, can I disp uh, disp build a report and display it on, on the mobile app? Um, so in two, I'll answer the first part. If you are looking to just display reports in mobile, there was an office hours that Thomas gave um, a few sessions ago that really goes through how to get started with mobile. Uh, but you wanna talk about these reports in mobile? So these particular reports, again, you're creating a report, right? So it's in the report designer. So anything, once you've created that query and you've saved it and you hit create report, it's directly in the report designer. So when you save that and you can establish uh, permissions to it, sharing permissions or whatnot, as soon as it's a report and you have actually created and saved it, it's no different than any other report that you have created uh, directly in the report designer. So therefore, yes, you can see it on a mobile device. Now actually creating, if that was gonna be the next question, creating queries directly in the mobile device, I don't know that I would wanna do that, uh, but I don't think that you can access it via mobile. It'd probably be a really small screen, uh, but um, let me find out uh, exactly more about that. So. Uh, if, if that's a question that whoever asked that, because I actually can't see the questions here, whoever asked that, if they maybe want to uh, generate a question in the community and tag me and let me get a little bit more information about that just to make sure that that is, if it is or it is not uh, possible at this point. But general, general recommendation is, is using it is if you, you can build the report in the, uh, at your computer, but then you will be able to access it and view it from mobile. Correct. If it's been if it's been set up to to view on mobile, like uh, Adam was saying, if you go back and look at the office house from a few weeks ago, if you've done all of those things, then absolutely you can see that report. Um, and another question about about roles. Uh, so I think you mentioned it earlier, but can you recap the query builder? What roles do I need to be able to use it? Is it something that every ITIL user can use, uh, or is there a specific role for it? 
So let me go back uh, to that particular slide. So, so here are the roles that are uh, required. And uh, so a CMDB query builder read to only view and run save queries and the CMDB query builder, they're contained for idle, idle admin and assets. So if, you, if a user has those, any one of those three, they would already have the ability or those are the particular roles that you could sign for viewing. If someone just needed to view the query that somebody else had built out, then you would give them the view one. But if they needed to create them, then that was the role there that you would actually give them as well. Great. And then uh, another question we came in having to do with some of the other reporting. Um, does this allow for, for you to join tables that cannot be dot walked in standard reporting? So, um, so again, this kind of goes back to I, sort of like the, the, very, the very first question about using it in, in other, uh, other places inside of the platform. You have to be able to establish a, re a relationship between the CI at the, at the business service level, the service offering level. You have to be able to establish a relationship between something there and something else in the platform in order for you to actually use the query builder. If there's no direct uh, or even indirect relationship, if there's no way to tie the two together, then, um, then you unfortunately wouldn't be able to, to actually see that uh, inside the query builder itself. So when you look for, you know, in the non CMDB tables, uh, when you search there, if there's a particular table that doesn't come up, then there's, there's no way to actually establish a relationship there, so that would sort of define whether or not you could or you could not. So it, it doesn't let us um, ref, uh, join to like non CMDB tables that don't have that don't have a reference that that correct that string that matches that do some of the things that we might be asking for. But it does allow us to traverse the relationship table in CMDB, which you generally cannot dot walk through, and you can't dot walk through multiple relationships. So correct. It um, if it's CMDB related, yes. But if it's not seem to be related, then no, it doesn't let you do other like joining on username or something to that effect. And, and I know that this is um, getting better and, and Adam, even yourself could probably speak to that better than I. Uh, but I know that this is getting better with every release. And I know that in the Paris release, there's quite a few uh, things that are new things that are actually coming to this um, as well. So you know, um, it, it may not happen now, but I would, I would think, you know, generally in the future, maybe that's, that's something there, but, but even Adam, if you want to take a moment to just speak on how, how much better this has become sure. in, in the past few years. Sure. And, and this pertains to, to all of us in, in different versions where, uh, the demo we saw, this was in Orlando. Is that correct, Thomas? Uh, yes, this is Orlando. Correct. So, so this is what we have in Orlando in Paris. It looks slightly different. It's a little clearer, uh, when you look at it, the starting nodes marked, but, um, it, or if you can do it in Orlando, you can do it in Paris, but I think there are definitely improvements in Paris. But if you go back, um, I believe the query builder was in, introduced in Madrid. Um, it didn't Correct. let us use other tables. You could only do CMDB to CMDB. Um, we were able to, uh, in New York, add other tables, but we couldn't save them. They're through the releases, and it depends where you are. Um, uh, there are different... Uh, there's different capabilities. So if you're in Madrid, some of this stuff may not work out well for you. Uh, but once you get to Orlando, you're gonna be able to do everything that we saw today. And in Paris, there'll be improvements. There's a lot of effort being put into this. Um, but be aware, if you, if you are sitting in New York, um, the, not everything in this demo will work. It doesn't work with, getting it to work with PA is much more challenging. Uh, so it's there, a lot of improvements have come and a lot of improvements are, go are going to come. Um, so make sure you really the, read the release notes and, and uh, Stay tuned with us um, as we'll go through these. Okay, uh, a few more questions that have come in um, and please keep, please keep uh, sending them to us. So sharing reports, uh, in sharing these reports, do the recipients of the reports need, to ha need to, the role to use the query builder to, to view the view, do I need the role? So um, that's, a, that's a great question, and I actually need to look that up directly, but I believe that uh, having the, the view role, the CMDB view role, would allow uh, someone to see that data because that essentially is what allows them to see the query builder in the actual table that uh, was viewed. But you can find those particular um, 
tables inside the instance. And obviously you could apply uh, any sort of, um, you know, security or, or sharing permission that you would want directly on those tables if you had to. But uh, having the view would allow uh, people to, to see the underlying data uh, that's inside of uh, the report. Um, and, and that's a great question. And I actually would like to look a little bit deeper uh, into that to see exactly uh, does it take on the report viewer role uh, since you've created it in report designer. Uh, so I need to find um, that particular one out. Um, and again, I cannot see who's asking that, but Adam, if you could just tell yeah. me their name and I'll get back to them. We'll, we'll have the list of questions and we'll put that in into the, uh, the update to this. Yeah, absolutely. about that one. It's a great question about if for somebody who doesn't have the ITIL role, would they be able to see it? Because if they do, Correct. anybody with ITIL is not going to have a problem, but if they don't have ITIL, would they be able to? Yeah, I will find that out. And when I actually um, update the uh, community blog on this, I'll make sure that that information is in there. Great. Okay, another question. Um, and a comp we're going to go with this first. That Query Builder uh, really opens up standardization and optimization options with report sources. Yes, yeah, the, it, it does. Um, and leveraging report sources. These are we've talked about report sources in the past. They're 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 good. Um, this allows us to get it get it in there as well. Um, and I, I want to make the note too that every query you run ends up creating a table for you. Um, and one question that that we're going to try and be clear about too is if you create a table. Uh, are there any licensing implications? And this is the query builder tables are exempt from, uh, they are not counted as custom tables, even though it does create a new table for you. Um, and the question part of that was, uh, can we use report sources um, in interactive filters? You can use interactive filters on reports with report sources, but I don't, so I'm reading this now, you, you could build, yeah, I think you could, no. I don't think you can build an interactive filter where you just define a report source. It's the interactive filters are on tables, but that's a really good um, idea. Uh, so if we come back to that, um, I, I'm gonna take a look at that, but I, I don't believe you can do that today. And if you wanna submit that in the idea portal, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but um, to be able to define interactive filters in a new way based on a with the conditions in a report source seems like pretty uh, pretty interesting idea. All right, here's here's another one for you. This this one might be a little bit more challenging. Um, what would you suggest we take in, into consideration to select our first node? How do how do I know where to start? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so let, let's take another use case, for example. So if let's say that you were curious about um, the clusters that were um, the, the Unix clusters that were on a particular uh, server out there. So um, when you think about it like that, so, so probably the first place that you want to start would be the server itself, the hardware, right? So you would want to look for CI hardware and then find a server. And then you would want to bring out um, perhaps a service offering or a business service where you're looking for a uh, particular Unix information, uh, a nodes or anything like that. So um, I don't know that it necessarily answers your question, but I guess the, the point that I'm making is, you know, it's about figuring out what it, what it really is, you know, in, in that use case, you're saying, okay, I want to see the servers. I want to, I want to find the servers that have, you know, Unix on there and then the clusters that are associated with that particular uh, Unix that are on that particular server. So when you think about it like that, server is where we want to, where we want to start, right? So in our particular use case, we just wanted to establish the, the ability between a business service and incident and then applied the CI. So in that case, right, so it kind of was the last thing that we added as opposed to the very first thing. Uh, could you start with uh, Hoover and then work your way around? You probably could, uh, but it really comes down to um, what those, those relationships are and uh, what is most paramount. And I think for a situation, like I just said, it would be the server. So identifying what is that sort of first thing uh, for you really comes down to establishing what's the end goal of the data that you're actually 
you know, trying to see. And I, and I don't know if that necessarily answers your question. And, and I got to wonder, I, I think that that's one of those questions where um, any, any given person could probably give it a little bit differently. Um, and we have a, um, a gentleman uh, here at ServiceNow, his name is, is, is Scott, and he's actually called the CMDB Whisper. And uh, that, that would be a, a question that I think that I could um, definitely ask him. And uh, that way, if we have a more definitive answer, that would, I think, sound a lot better than, than probably what I'm um, given right now. And I could definitely add that into um, the blog as well when I post this, because Again, I think that it, it really comes down to the individual uh, circumstance and, of course, the person that's actually creating the query um, as well. And, Adam, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to that, but I think, you know, a a asking the CMDB whisperer, that may be the best uh, thing and, and, and adding that into the blog. I do. Well, well here's, here's my take on that. Um, so given the group of people that we have, we have here, we're, we're mainly focused on analytics. Um, I, I've been working with ServiceNow for seven and a half years. And I have tried to stay clear of CMDB for that time, right? It's just not something I needed to do. I certainly work with task and build custom apps and I, lots of performance analytics, but CMDB I've been able to stay clear of. The point of this session was to scare you and realize that we, that's not going to be the world that we all live in anymore. We're going to have to understand um, uh, CMDB. CSDM is coming. It's, it's the recommendation we have as, as part of ServiceNow. Um, and I, we should have put a poll up, you know, are you scared or excited or, or something else? Um, I'm a little of both going through this because I got to learn more about CMDB and relationships um, and how to leverage them. The, what we wanted you to get out of this was there, is new, there, there are new applications to use. There's a new world that we have to be able to be familiar with. Uh, I highly recommend you take, you take the lab. So there's the CSDM lab. Um, I think the query, Thomas had the list, the query builder lab, there's training and now learning. I highly encourage you to, to go out into now learning and take some of these classes, take them now, get ahead of the, ahead of the curve. Um, some of this, some of these things are going to make your life easier quickly. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to make your life immediately easier. Things that were a hassle to do before, particularly with views and where you needed your admin to do something in an update set. Now you can just do. Um, so, so, just, I, I really want to scare you into taking these into taking these labs and these classes. You're going to be able to add a lot of value to your organization. And if you don't, the CSDM is going to come bite you. Uh, so we wanted to give you this opportunity to give you a preview of what, what's possible, what we're talking about, and point you to some resources so that you are well prepared to help your organization really thrive and just take advantage just of everything that's in service now. The CSDM stuff make, will make our, our lives better. It will make our workflows better. It'll make our analytics better. It'll make our companies run better, but it's different. And it's something that, that we need to learn and, and you're in a good place to, to do that right now. Okay, uh, a couple more questions um, and please keep them, keep coming in. Uh, if, I understand, uh, if I understand correctly, the uh, user, uh, any ITIL user can create a query build, a CMDB query builder and can create a, a, a data source, a report source would the list of report source grow, sources grow to be an unmanageable list? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a good point. And it's, it's probably not um, anything that's indifferent than, you know, the fact that, um, you know, people can create, can, can save reports now as report sources. And, you know, I think it's, it really comes down to, um, you know, the business itself and what restrictions and what permissions or whatnot that um, it allows, um, you know, you, you, maybe you want to assign that um, directly and not give someone necessarily the, the, the idle role. If you have that, you know, if you're in a position to do that. Um, I know that, you know, a few of the things that we did here, you know, scheduling reports and report sources and things like that, there are definitely uh, businesses out there that really restrict that. Um, so, you know, again, I think you have to look at the business itself and what, what is allowed and what is not, but, um, you know, it's a good point. I mean, I think if something is left wide open, it does obviously open up the, the chances of, you know, the control factor, uh, sort of, um, being taken away. So again, I think that comes down to the use case of the business itself and what it, what it wants to do and, and then establishing the roles that 
are, you know, directly, you know, necessary for uh, the people that are going to be creating these things. You know, I, I don't know that the average, um, just average user, people that aren't necessarily on this call would would search for CMDB Query Builder and do something with it, but anything, I guess, is possible. Uh, so I think that you you have to ask yourself as a business decide what, what, how those roles are going to necessarily work out. Um, Adam, I don't know if you want to add something to that. Yeah, it, I mean, there, there is an issue here where an ITIL user can't create a report source today. You, you, I think you need to be a report admin. Um, so Thomas, you always see that because you're always a report admin, but yeah. our general users can't always create report sources. Um, so yeah, yeah, this is where we could start seeing report sources we wouldn't expect. Um, and, and specifically the names, the report source, it, it takes on the name of the query. So you can run into duplicate names then. So I think there is an issue for us to, to, to look at and how do we do it. Um, if I were dealing with this today, um, I'd, I'd want to be managing and watching my report sources that are based off of, of these tables. The tables all start with them. Um, CMDB Query Builder, I think, something to that effect. So it's easy to tell the report sources that are that came from CMDB Query Builder. It's something I want to watch, and and it is something as we're as we're all stretching our our legs, getting into Query Builder and reporting. Um, we, I'll tell you, Thomas and I have a list of ideas on how do we make this better. But I want to hear yours as, as well as you're as you're working with this. If you have concerns, you have questions, post them in the community um, and put in the ideas in the idea portal so we can make it better. Uh, again, the, the query builder has grown very rapidly each release and adding new capabilities. Um, and so if this is something we need to watch and maintain, then that's what we need to do. Um, so we, we'd love to hear that feedback. And, and it's, of course, incredibly valuable. And I took that question down too. I'm going to find out a little bit more information about that as well to, to, to make sure that um, Maybe there's there's a restriction somewhere that I'm just I just didn't put in this uh, slide deck that that you can do. So I'll find out about that as well. Yeah, and the, and there is lots of documentation in the labs that go through details. Um, Twenty minutes will not replace taking uh, spending a couple hours on in the lab and really getting your hands dirty and going through each of those things. Okay, uh, using Query Builder, can we report on related items, uh, downstream relationships? Well, I mean, that's, that's um, essentially what you sort of saw today was, you know, we, we started at, um, you know, tying business services to, um, to incidents in general, and then we went further to say, okay, we want the CI to be able to, um, you know, uh, show us just Hoover, and we connected that directly to the business service um, as well. So there, there are some, um, some pretty dynamic, uh, queries that are, they're out there that I have actually seen that are, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight levels, uh, down in. And, you know, um, a lot of those are, um, potentially things that you could get to from a related items list, um, inside of, uh, reporting or an indicator source or things or like that. But that's, just, that's basically establishing those relationships, um, you know, knowing what the reference is and, and establishing those particular re relationships. So there, there's definitely multiple levels that you can go to. Um, and again, if there is a reference like Adam was talking about earlier, if there is a reference uh, between the two things that you want to bring together, then you can definitely establish that um, directly in the query builder. And, and in the query builder, so one of the example, the example we saw with incidents, in the query that's saved, that's run on the scheduled basis, you have, you have incidents, but then the dot walking is done in the report. So if I wanna, if I wanna say, give me all the incident, the example we had, if I wanna see all the incidents that dealt with the service that was supported by Hoover's, good, I have that. But now if I wanna add more conditions like that are in the finance department or not in the finance department, I certainly can do that. You have all, once you're in report designer, you have this right. one saved data set that, that's refreshing on the schedule basis, but the rest of it is just dot walks. Um, all of that, that works the same. Um, and right. the same thing, we should have related list conditions. Uh, how do I retire something? When tables are created in Query Builder, are they permanent or is there some type of, of cleanup job um, or scheduling? Um, we, we schedule the report, how long does it last? So the, the table itself that is created from the query if you have a schedule, right? And so you have to have a schedule in order for you to create a report, 
that table will continuously be wrote to, you know, depending on how often that you run uh, the schedule, it will continuously write to that particular table that that report is using. So uh, if you if you create a new report, meaning you've changed the, uh, the definitions inside the query itself, if you've changed that particular report and it has a new table now that it's writing to, then you can definitely um, go and remove that particular table. But understand that if there is anything that is tied to that particular uh, table, if there's any other reports that were created directly to it in report designer or whatnot, that you know there would be impact uh, there. But if there is no um, impact and, and those reports uh, themselves have been retired that are looking at the data that you wanna retire, then you can absolutely remove that as well. Um, I, and I believe the I believe the data gets purged out of the tables at some at some interval. So there is some cleanup process for it, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, I, I don't know if there's an expiration like if you haven't refreshed the data in so long, delete it. Um, but if there is, there's going to be some settings for that because some of this I actually only need to refresh once, you know, on demand. So we don't know when you when you can do it. Um, so there might be some manual cleanup that you want to look at. But in, I know in terms of data, I believe we do purge out the stale data at, at some point. Um, but that that would be covered more in the C, in the Query Builder Lab and in the Query Builder documentation for those specific details. And I'll and I'll find that out as well and, and add that. We're gonna have a nice long list of information for you. Yeah, um, it's great. Uh, okay, uh, I just uh, clarify one that, one that came in about the downstream having to do with IP connections. And yeah, that's understanding the relationships in in the query in cmdb you can query pretty much anything like i want to know all we, we used hoover's data because that's that's what we had in, in our in our demo set but certainly you could say give me all the services that depend on um you know this virtual server on this ip uh you'd eventually you'd be able to build that 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 is the power that is why query builder exists is to be able to do the, those types of dependencies and traverse the the relationship hierarchy you know what's consumed by depends on whatever relationships you're defining, you, you can tune all those. So it can get complicated. You have to really understand your query, your, uh, your CMDB, but the query builder will let you query it. Whereas today, if you did that, you'd have to build some massive single purpose views um, that may have performance problems. And, and if you've queried CMDB with some of those views, you've felt those, queer, those performance problems. This allows us to shift that to maybe uh, once a day, you know, how often do my IPs and everything change anyways? So once a day or, or once every half hour, whatever you need to be for your use case, I'm saving, I'm saving that data. And then I'm, I'm able to query it quickly on my dashboard. So that, that is why we want to talk about it. Some, some really things that you were unable to do or were really difficult to do now become much more practical um, when you know to use the query builder first. Okay. Um, when, does the data get written to the PA tables? Uh, Thomas, you want to answer that? How, how does it work with PA? So, um, so I'm guessing we're talking about when we use that particular um, report source or data source inside of an indicator source, and then you create an indicator. So, so yes, I mean, the, the indicator and the indicator source work exactly the same way that it would if you were going directly to um, a table or another uh, data source that you had that was that was created. So when you run the um, the indicator and collect that data, it, it's going to store that the, the data that it got from those particular or that particular report uh, source or data source directly in uh, the PA scores table like it like it has any other time. Yeah, the, the value the you know, one of the benefits we get from doing this in Query Builder is now I, it's, it is a table and any, we, we, I mean, not a view, it is a table and I can use the data, the data from the table anywhere I want to, any way I want to. Um, so lots of very powerful things by doing this in two parts rather than trying to do it all in one, one pass. Uh, and that, yes, and the PA, the PA jobs need to be created. So yeah. the Query Builder builds a table and now you need to configure PA. Right at the end of the day, that you need to configure PA. Um, there, uh, uh, there are a couple of interesting things about it uh, as you go through. So e each query, each save query, is a different table. So your breakdown mappings might need to have. Well, your breakdown mappings do need to be mapped to each one of those queries. So, and it's a little bit weird. Or each one of those tables, and the, the table name is a. 
got a sys id in the table name right. it's a little a little quirky um <clears throat> it absolutely can be done when you need to do it uh it is not the smoothest experience today and that that feedback's already been received uh thomas and i were we were uh looking at it quite clearly so we're putting some of those requirements in to make it better but you can do it today you absolutely can do it today and hopefully in the future it'll just be easier to do easier to maintain so yeah when you i mean when you when you look for whatever you're looking for at the indicator source level and uh and you click preview like you've done on anything else you literally will get back the same amount of results that uh that you saw directly in um the results when you ran it from cb cmdb query so again it's just it's just telling it where to go, and then you have to, you know, create your indicator, add that indicator to a job, run your job, and everything works the same way after that point. Okay, and uh, another question we, we have in here, I think this relates to some of what we've seen before. Um, can the ITFM module, uh, so the financial management, uh, use the query builder in the creation of weighted metrics? Uh, wow. I can take this one if you, if you like. Yeah, <laughs> I think the, I think the answer is no. Um, uh, you, not for ITFM data specifically, if you are, uh, there's no, there's no special magic here. All this is doing is it's allowing me to get the query, the query data out, uh, the CMDB data out into a reportable method. So if you just need to know your CMD, if you need to analyze your CMDB data and then in context of the financial information, then, then yes. Um, but it's not just a query tool to, to build your other situ your other metrics out. Um, that might be a different topic, maybe something to put in, into the community with some questions on what you're trying to do and where you're struggling. But I, I, my guess is that CMDB query builder is not going to help you with that um, unless you're specifically trying to get CMDB data out. Um, and, and I'll say that the, it's not just query builder, it's CMDB query builder. It's very much anchored in CMDB optimized for CMDB. Um, so, and that's, that's where we focus. Okay. Um, I think we need to, to wrap it up so we can finish, finish on time. If you have, um, any more questions, um, feel free to, uh, post them. We, once we post this recap, you can just post them on that article and, and we'll see them. Um, oh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to bring this up again. There, there was a question about, um, a number of tables, the CMDB query builder tables that are created and it does create tables. They are, they are on the exempted list. So they do not impact your subscriptions for custom tables. They, they, they don't impact them. Um, uh, volume size is a, a different issue and in, in data size, but the, the tables themselves are exempt. They are not counted as custom tables, although they are a new, they, they are effectively custom table in that they're created by you. Um, they are not counted by us. We do not consider them to be custom tables. Okay. Thomas, I'm going to take sharing back. Okay, thank you. All right, so just as, as we wrap up, we really appreciate everybody's time here. Uh, before we meet again in a couple of weeks, uh, it, we we're going to post the recap of this with the video, the deck, um, the links. I know there are lots of links in this one. Some of the follow-up uh, follow of the questions that we have, they'll be posted on the office hours post in the community. Um, and you'll see what, what's uh, coming up next. What's coming up next is what we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks is descripting uh, performance analytics scripts. Uh, so how can you improve the usability, uh, get more, 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 more out of what you do in a script, and how do you Im uh, incre improve the performance of performance analytics jobs by reducing scripts, by reducing the, your dependency on scripts? So we're gonna go through a bunch of use cases where we commonly see scripts being applied and give you alternatives on how you can approach it. It's not a one-stop solution, but we're gonna talk about if you see a script like this, here is something you can do to not, to not use the script. And that's gonna give you the ability to use it in reports, not just in PA, uh, to use it in predictive intelligence, not just in PA, uh, use interactive filters on it and get much better performance out of your jobs. So uh, stay tuned, two weeks we'll be, we'll be talking about that and just going through those examples of use cases and how, how you can uh, address the same use case without using a performance analytics script. And again, let us know what you think, right? So we have an article here for you. Please tell us what you'd like us to talk about. Sometimes we're gonna tell you what you need to know like, the, like today, but uh, often we just wanna hear what you have to say and we'll address it. And until next time, um, again, 
you have, if you have questions, you don't have to wait uh, for two weeks, post them in the community, um, share your expertise. I know I see many of the names on here and I know you know a lot. Uh, so please share your expertise with the rest of us. Um, and if you need some help, ask for help. There are some, some amazing experts out there besides, uh, besides Thomas and myself and, and uh, David on the call. So ask your questions, please post a screenshot when you can. That really helps you get a much more targeted answer. It's really gonna help you. All the recordings of the office hours before are available. Go, go read those if you missed them. We, there was one on mobile, you can, you can hit up mobile. Uh, there's one on report sources. Uh, all of Thomas's came up today. Uh, but those are out there, uh, catch up. Um, you can listen to the recording, grab the deck, skim over it. They're available for you. If you have ideas, we had a couple really, really interesting, great ideas come up from you. I, I love to hear them. Put them in the idea portal. That allows them to get, uh, that's a direct line into our inbound product managers to see them. And uh, again, as uh, I'd love to leverage your expertise. If you have time, look through some of those ideas and say, hey, that's a great idea. I really want to see that too. When we, when we see the ideas in there, um, you can talk about them, you can comment on them, and you can upvote them. When we see an idea that's got a, a bunch of people wanting it, we have no choice but to, to address that um, however we can. So make sure you, take, you leverage the idea portal. Um, again, that's, that's your direct voice into us, and, you, and you'll see how things are progressing. And particularly on this topic, take some training. There, there's just an, an amazing amount of free and self-paced training, right? You can do it at your own pace. doesn't cost you anything in now learning. Uh, nowlearning.servicenow.com. The CMDB is there. Uh, CMDB is there. CMDB Query Builder is there. CSDM is there. Lots of PA. Um, also, if as we're expanding, take a look at the virtual agent fundamentals, predictive intelligence fundamentals, some really great, great classes. A lot of our content's going to be refreshed for Paris um, in the very near future, uh, really coming up. So make sure you're checking out what's there. And, and stay tuned for those updates as Paris gets released. And the K, the Knowledge20 labs are there as well, uh, which, we're, which we're referencing. So you can just browse those or, or you'll see the links. So thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. This recording will be posted uh, on, on the community on YouTube. And we look forward to seeing you in another two weeks.